Welcome to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest news on Google for education, tips, tricks, and teaching ideas you can use in class tomorrow. And here are your hosts, Matt Miller from DitchThatTextbook.com and Casey Bell from ShakeUpLearning.com. Welcome to episode 48 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. So apparently I have started something. I uh, I, ha- I have a tendency to make up new things, give people nicknames, get super excited, bant. Uh, mm-hmm. so, and these things have caught on with the tribe, Matt, or yes. who I like to call Jimmy Matt. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to live the Jimmy Matt thing down. I was just telling Casey, I was doing an interview on another podcast and somebody there called me Jimmy Matt. It's just the Jimmy Matts are just flying kind of all over the place, I think. They are. You have become a hashtag. You are you're now. For, nobody cares what the J actually stands for. Right. Anymore. And it's you not are. Jimmy. It's not Jimmy. <laughs> So uh, this this harkens back to a few episodes back. So if you have no idea what we're talking about, that's completely okay. It's become this little inside joke with the tribe. But uh, apparently it has become so popular that another teacher actually used Jimmy Matt in her lesson. Did you oh happen to see this, Matt? Yes. Yes, I did, actually. So this was Lisa Scumpieru, and uh, she she showed a, uh, a warm-up activity she was doing in her class. And she says, here's basically what it says. It says, Jimmy Matt, what would the person with this name look like? Where would they live and what would be their occupation? And so we're left to wonder what the kids thought about this because Lisa didn't post any of the answers, which I would be fascinated to see what they thought a Jimmy Matt would look like or what what he would do or whatever. So we're always we're always interested to well not like interested but we're kind of fascinated whenever the tribe actually makes it into a classroom, which which did happen on another uh, on another instance too when um, tribe regular Laura Steinbrink uh, she tweeted something about a rap that one of her students did and then Casey and I performed it on on the show and we we're like yeah but that student will never hear us you know in our pathetic rap skills <laughs> <laughs> and so then then what does Laura do she tweets it right out and she says uh sorry casey but i think i'll play it in class today and we're both like oh (laughs) no oh that's okay anything for the students right right right. i'm sure they had just as much fun laughing (laughs) at us yes so we we do like to have fun here on the google teacher tribe and you know matt and i just We just love talking and chatting and sharing our favorite ideas and connecting Mm -hmm. with you. And that's what it's all about. So, uh, you know, we we have some great things in store in this episode. What's coming up, Matt? Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about something that I hear a lot of people talk about related to Google tools, and that has to do with quizzes, specifically Google Forms quizzes. Uh, Last week, we did a deep dive into Google Drive. Now we're going to do a deep dive into this one particular feature of the quizzes and how we can use them effectively and what all of the options are and everything. So if you haven't really delved into Google Forms quizzes, this is the time to do it. And of course, we have Google News and Updates. And of course, we have feedback from our listeners. And of course, we have some blogs to share with you. And I am ready. I, Jimmy Matt Miller, am ready to get going on this episode. How about you, Casey? Let's go. Let's dig into some Google News and Updates. Our last episode managed to make it through without a reference to Google Arts and Culture. <gasps> that, that's got to be like one of the first in a long time, right? Like I'm, yes. I'm trying to remember. I don't think we had anything. Yes. But we do in this episode. So Google Arts and Culture, I swear, this must be one of the hardest working groups at Google because they always have something going on, something updated, something on the blog, something to share. 
And now they're telling us that machine learning is now coming in to meet Google Arts and Culture. So, so there's a lot of different things that we can see from this. And this blog post actually has some videos and other things that you can check out. But this is whether we're helping physicians identify disease or finding photos of hugs. AI is behind a lot of the work we do at Google and at our Arts and Culture Lab in Paris. Um, that's in France, y'all. <laughs> not Paris, Texas. <laughs> Not not where I grew up, I guarantee yeah. you. There's so, a Paris, Illinois, uh, less than an hour from my house, just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's equally as exciting. Yes. <laughs> We've been experimenting with how AI can be used for the benefit of culture. So today they're sharing their latest experiments, and these are prototypes that build on seven years of work and partnerships with the 1,500 cultural institutions that they have around the world. So Lots of different pieces. I know that was a lot to sort of take in, but they've got this art palette. So the art palette lets you choose a color palette and using a combination of um, algorithms, it's going to match with artwork. So it's going to find artwork in the color palette that you want. So it's going to give you a different way to look at things, a different way to analyze things, to talk about art and, and color. There's also... Um, a way to give historic photos a new lease on life. So 4 million of the Life magazine photos are now available for anyone to look through. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. So this makes me excited because I've been missing that piece. Since they changed the insert image options, we sort of lost that filter where we could grab those Life magazine images. So I'm hoping this will give us at least another way to look at them. Mm -hmm. But it says... um, that that you can you scroll in the what the example they have here is babies making funny faces and they Aww. are stinking cute let me tell you so so you can do that there's also identifying the um the moma the metropolitan museum of art artworks through machine learning so you can automatically um identify the art in the photos and this is something that it will comb through and find different types of information inside these photos. So it's a repository that is pretty much unmatched, I would think, of 30,000 photos. So it's, you know, keeping keeping all of it. I mean, bring I always say Google's archiving the world. And I think arts and culture is the perfect example of this. Mm-hmm. But there's just so much in here. And like I said, you know, I almost feel like it's it's become an automatic that we're going to talk about arts and culture because there's so, always something new here to share. And I'm just fascinated at what machine learning lets us do. I think it it takes some of the mundane, repetitive, and then sometimes too big for us to do tasks and really makes them things that we can wrap our brains around. So, um, yeah, all good stuff there. Uh, the other thing we wanted to talk about in the news and updates were a couple of integrations with Google Classroom. And so... On the keyword blog, the um, the the writers pulled out a few of the things that you can do with Classroom, and one of them is this neat tool called Workbench. It says it lets teachers create, browse, and modify PBL project based learning projects and assign the projects to students all in one platform. So what you can do from there is you can track student progress. They're automatically notified when students complete projects. And so if you haven't checked out Workbench and you do PBL-based activities, it might be something worth checking out. And it does integrate nicely with Google Classroom. Another one is quizzes. Quizzes is one of my favorite tools out there. Um, you know, it's kind of similar in in many ways to Kahoot, if you're f- more familiar with that. And quizzes integrates very well with Google Classroom, where you can create a quiz or an activity and assign it right there in into Google Classroom. Students go off and answer all of the questions, and then all of their grades can be pulled right back into Google Classroom. Uh, so those all integrate very nicely. There's a third one that Casey found also, and that is uh, Math Games. If you go to mathgames.com, you know, this is where you have all of these fully aligned activities and games with the Common Core State Standards, and it integrates with Google Classroom also. And you can, you get all of this great data that goes along with the activities, and then you can pull it right into Google Classroom. So, uh, you know, there are tons of things that you can do alongside Google Classroom, and these are just a few of them.
So our featured segment on the episode today has to do with quizzes in Google Forms. And I still remember it wasn't that long ago when teachers were using Google Forms and they wanted to use them for, you know, formative assessments, quizzes, you know, whatever you want to call them. And there just wasn't a great functionality built in for it. And so we started using some of the workarounds like the like using Flubaroo to automatically grade student quizzes. And, um, you know, there's there's still some use for that today. Uh, But not too long ago, they they released some updates to Google Forms that allowed us to have quizzes built into forms natively, like it's just baked into Google Forms. It's, it's made our lives as teachers and as students a little bit better in some ways because we have some of that instant feedback that comes along with an automated, auto-graded type of quiz. And so we thought we would take a little bit of time to dig into if you haven't used the quizzes feature that much or um, if you're still trying to find some ways that you could use it in your class, we wanted to dig into some of the features that that make this this really work. So... Um, so I know one of the one of the big ones for me is that you can get feedback immediately uh, right after you're done taking a, a quiz on Google Forms. Obviously, what you can do is you go into your form and under the under the settings, once you've turned on your quiz, you're able to add some feedback that the students will see right after they're done. And one of the big things that that I'm always talking to teachers about, and I hope that, that we remember is that whenever kids get that instant in the moment feedback, that's that's a huge thing. And if they don't have to wait for it for a day or two days, kind of like we might with traditional homework, you know, if we can get it while we're still in the moment of wrestling with a, a question or a problem, that that can be really, really big. So that's that's one of the things that I really love about it myself. It is very powerful. I mean, making that connection, that immediate connection to their learning and getting that that immediate feedback is so powerful. And so the ability to do that with the Google Forms quizzes, and I don't know, are you struggling with this? Because now I have to think about it. I feel like I'm saying quiz is and we just talked about oh. quiz is, but <laughs> we, so have to start spelling. we are talking about a feature inside Google form. So I'm, I'm actually going to back up just a second for those of you who are new to this. So if you, if you've ever used Google forms, you would just go to forms.google.com and you can create a new form to create a quiz. You actually have to designate that form as a quiz. So you can do that from the forms homepage, or if you're already in the form itself, you can go into the settings. You're going to see three tabs and you're going to go to the last tab, which says quizzes. And that's where you toggle this option on. And the difference between this and a a regular form, the form is really designed to be a survey tool. That's that it's collecting information. When we turn on the quizzes feature, it's collecting information that has most likely a right or wrong answer that it's going to automatically try to grade. And so you can do that to help give that immediate feedback that we're talking about. So some of the options when you set this up, when you see this in settings and you toggle that on, is you can decide if students immediately get the grade right after they click submit. So, um, so th- which, which is great and that's, that's nice, but also you may have a few questions in there that you want to manually grade. For instance, you might have some multiple choice questions, but you might have a little bit of a, you know, a short answer type of thing that you, the teacher have to evaluate because Google forms is just not that smart yet. Although maybe someday. Mm-hmm. So, so you could do that and then you can, so under release grade, you would choose later. So after you manually review it so that you would have time to go in and review those, those pieces. But um, you can also let the respondent see if they miss questions, the correct answers themselves and the point values that you assign to each question. So one of the things I hear a lot about the quizzes feature is just that it requires a lot of clicks to set up. So this is a little bit more uh, intense than just setting up a survey, which they've made it so quick and easy, you know, name, date, whatever you're collecting. But when you're really creating a quiz, it, it could take some more time to put all of that good information in there. But what's great, like Matt was pointing out, is that immediate feedback. So if if it's the answer is incorrect 
you can help them understand why they got it incorrect. Mm -hmm. And that might be uh, come in a variety of formats, right? You could link to a video, you could link to a resource, you can explain it, um, you know, however uh, your content allows you to do that. So, um, but just in terms of setting it up, I just wanted to point out a a few of those things there. Obviously, I would say having these auto graded quizzes like this shouldn't be our entire assessment plan, I think. Um, however, I do feel like um, auto graded things like this sometimes do get a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, but I don't think that they're, they necessarily need to all the time, especially if we are asking the kinds of questions that could be auto graded. I think if we let Google Forms grade those, that's important. And when you look at some of the you know, some of the research and some of the, the experts that talking about, that talk about feedback. Like, for instance, uh, Valerie Shute, uh, published a, a paper called Focus on Formative Feedback. And she said that if, um, feedback is presented in manageable units and to keep feedback as simple as possible, but no simpler than that, um, you know, those are two best practices when they come to feedback. And whenever students get feedback in Google Forms, uh, through the, you know, through the feedback once they have submitted it, then that's basically what, what they're doing. So it's not to say that doing something auto graded is necessarily a worse way to do it. Um, in fact, it can be, it can have, have some really good benefits. So it just, it just depends on what you're, what you're looking to do. I love the fact that when you're setting this up and you have to, you know, you choose your answers and you can choose to add answer feedback that it allows you to enter feedback for the things that are correct and the things that are incorrect. So that even though it's simplistic enough that maybe it's multiple choice, they could have gotten it correct just by guessing, right? Mm -hmm. But if they see that feedback that they got it correct and it explains why it's correct, I think that helps also bring that connection back to the learning. So, and and of course, you do have the option to add the links there too. So that helps us add those additional resources. The other thing I want to keep in mind is even though this is designed to help us create what they call the graded quiz, right? The word grade, which... I don't know about you, but I'm I'm sort of beginning to hate these days. But, you know, this is an assessment. And and so assessment and feedback are a huge part of what we do. And even though we have the option to assign points, those points don't actually have to mean anything. This can be very formative if you want to use it in that way. So not to feel that this has to beats assigned to to some kind of point system um but but that you can make use of the tool to to leverage that in your classroom so i i you know i think we sometimes get caught up in what the tools are intended to do yeah. and and it has that that point feature you can assign points to each one and you can even export your grades into google classroom if you want but that aside you can use it for how however works for you to, to kind of follow up on that, you know, we've got a couple of different kinds of assessment. We've got assessment of learning, and that's where we want to collect those, you know, those points and the right and the wrong. And we want to see if students have actually learned. But then we've also got assessment as learning where we're using the assessment to kind of work through things ourselves and, and use it as part of the learning process. And that's exactly what you were talking about, I think, is is assessment as learning. So I think I think that's an important an important um thing to point out. Now, one other thing that um, sometimes one other feature of the Google Forms quiz is that I think sometimes we have an interesting take on is in the little three dots menu, whenever you're setting it up, one of the options that you have in there is to shuffle the um, shuffle the order. A lot of times, I think whenever we as teachers use that shuffle feature, A lot of times we're thinking of it as a way of beating the cheaters or at least trying to beat the cheaters. And, you know, we think if we shuffle the questions or we shuffle the the option order, you know, the the letters, if we shuffle those around, it makes it harder for kids to kind of like copy off of each other. And that's and that's true. There's there's definitely some truth in that. However, there is also this idea of this thing called interleaving. I learned about this at the uh, the Learning Scientists blog. If you haven't checked it out before, I think it's just learningscientists.org. And 
the learning scientists talk about this idea of interleaving that says that whenever you practice things out of order, when it's a different order each time, it's more sticky in your long-term memory. And so by putting that option in there and using that, um, if we think about it, not just for trying to, to keep keep our uh, students from copying off of each other, but also realize that it promotes more long lasting, durable memory. I think that's even more of a reason for us to check that option. So there, there's one other thing that I would like to talk about because I see this question, get this question so often, and I know you do too, Matt, but so often I get the, the Twitter message, the email, um, whatever it is. And people are like, how can I lock down all the other tabs so that all my kids see oh, yes. is the Google form quiz? And I understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, the real world doesn't get shut off um, when we're learning. And so my response is usually something along the lines, can we rethink the types of questions that we're asking so that it's not so Googleable? So it's not like the top of a Google search. We need to be asking more critical thinking questions. And even though I know we still have a lot of, of memorization types of questions that are required in our curriculum, but are there some more creative ways that we can ask these types of things and design these assessments to, to let students have more original types of answers? And I think that really probably takes us beyond what the quizzes tool is designed <laughs> to do. Uh, go a little bit, lots of manual review, right. but I feel like it's a really important, it's, it's something is really important to me because school is not always so reflective of real world skills because guess what when my boss gives me a task he doesn't say oh but you can't you can't google anything right <laughs> you got to close all your other tabs this is that you ha you have to do you know like the connections that we make and the resources that we have those are real world skills and i tell people all the time when they take the google certification exams they're like oh, can we open other tabs I'm like yes you can <laughs> because guess what google thinks that it's actually a skill for you to be able to find answers you know so keeping that in mind as we design our assessments, that it's not about locking the rest of the world out, because guess what? The rest of the world is going to be mm -hmm. there um, when they're done with that that quiz or that assessment that they're working on. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes we, we just have to rethink the types of assignments that we're giving because of the world that we now live in. <laughs> Things have changed. And if I can ask Siri for the answer, then that might not be the best test question. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. And I think when, when we talk about these things, too, we also have to think about what kind of a classroom culture are we creating and what is it that that's actually motivating students? And, you know, there's an argument to be made that um, and not not everything can be ungraded, but giving students the opportunity to practice without grades before getting that final test. Now, I know some of you will go, yeah, but <laughs> what if we what if we want to do this with the the final test? But I think whenever there's so much emphasis on grading every single thing and putting a point value on every single thing, then all of a sudden our motivation goes from learning to collecting points. And um, yeah, I think there's a whole bigger topic of discussion here. Um, I know I have heard of some people that try to get at this this challenge by you know putting devices in kiosk mode or using a, a tool like go guardian to, to kind of like do the big brother spy over the kids' shoulders and everything. But, you know, the thing that I've found about a lot of those things too, is that once you think that you've got the students, the students are way more wily and creative than you expect. And then it becomes more like a game of how can we beat the system? Okay. Now they've figured out a way to look at us, but how am I going to be? And then it becomes, how can we, you know, how can we find a way to cheat instead of, Let's let's put the emphasis on the learning. So anyway, I know we, we kind of got in our, our ivory towers there for a little bit, but I think it's an important discussion to be had. And I, I think it definitely does fit with this quizzes feature. So um, so anyway, again, uh, if if you're still kind of wanting to learn more about Google Forms quizzes, we do have some more links and resources over at our show notes page at Google Teacher Tribe dot com slash 48. The Google Teacher Tribe podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. 
podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more great education podcasts, go to edupodcastnetwork.com. Okay, Tribe, it is time for my favorite part of the show. It's time to hear from you. So our first share today comes to us from Sarah Gershon in Waukegan, Illinois. And she has a speak pipe message that she has left for us, which FYI, we really love those. those. It's like leaving us a little voicemail. So thank you, uh, Sarah, for, for sharing this. She has tried out the idea of using choice boards with her students. So take it away, Sarah. My name is Sarah Gershon. I'm a health teacher in Waukegan, Illinois. I teach at Waukegan High School. Thank you so much for um, all you do and giving us so many great ideas. I just created a menu choice board for my health class, gave it to my students last week, and they are loving the options that um, I was able to create. So keep up the good work. Love it, love it, love it. Choice boards, learning menus, one of my favorite types of activities, something I, I talk a lot about, share a lot about, but I, I really like when I started using these in my classroom, it just changed everything for me. So I love that you're taking a risk and you're trying new things and your kids are getting to have some some more ownership of their learning in their classroom. So thank you so much for being a fan of the show and sharing what you're doing, yeah, Sarah. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Uh, the next one, this one came from Twitter and this was shared on the GT tribe hashtag by Mr. Blight. And he's said, I'm having some issues when putting my drawings files onto my site. It shows up faded when the site is published. Any thoughts or ideas? And I've got a couple of quick suggestions. Uh, One thing that you can do is go to file published to the web and you can grab the embed code. And if you're not already doing that, this is this is a newer feature that new Google Sites has has recently incorporated. So you copy that embed code once you've published your Google drawing. Remember, when you publish it, that doesn't mean that like everybody on the Internet is going to start showing up and looking at your stuff. But then you hit the embed button in your Google site and then paste that code in. And then now all of a sudden your embedded live Google drawing is there um, on your site. So that's one way to do it. Now, if you're still having trouble at that point, there is a sort of a fail safe that you can use. Uh, It means that it's not going to be updated as you change your Google drawing. But you can always go to file, download the Google drawing as an image. So just go to file, download as, and you can either use the JPEG image or the PNG image, doesn't matter. And then you can always stick it onto your site as an image. And then if you want to make a separate hyperlink, just like put a little line of text down below or or something and just say, um, you know, if you want to see the live updated version of this, click here. And that's that's kind of another way that you can work around that. So those are just a couple of things that you can do, I think, that that could help with that problem. Yeah, no. uh, And if anybody else has any ideas out there on what may be going on, and of course, if you have other questions or shares, please continue to share with us in the various places. You can go to googleteachertribe.com slash feedback and leave us a message. I said that was our favorite, yes. right? <laughs> hint, hint. Jimmy Matt loves it. So so leave us a message and we are, are happy to share things on on the, the podcast and continue to use the hashtag and just keep sharing. That's what it's all about. So let's head to the blogs. And for mine, I want to share something from a different blog than my own. Uh, One of my absolute favorite education blogs out there is Cult of Pedagogy by Jennifer Gonzalez. And she just recently (laughs) published this post. I love the, the headline on this. It says, OMG, Becky. PD is getting so much better. (laughs) I love that. And um, (laughs) so basically what she did was she jumped onto Twitter and she just put out a sort of a, an innocuous question just saying, Hey, um, what are your ideas for alternative PD structures? Like how could you do professional development differently? And she got this avalanche of ideas. And she basically pulled a bunch of those ideas together into this blog post. And so 
uh, you know, if you're if you're sick of sit and get professional development or just uh, doing it in the same old, same old way, uh, she's got some really cool ideas and some uh, specific examples of how educators have used them before. So she talks about unconferences, voluntary piloting, where a small group of teachers tries a new initiative and then reports the results to the staff, doing blended learning, you know, like online and together as a group, um, micro credentials or badging. And she's just got really, really neat ideas. So if you ever do any sort of professional development and you haven't checked this out, it's definitely worth looking at. And the, the URL is really easy to find, too. It's just cultofpedagogy.com slash PD. So definitely go check that one out. Oh, yeah. Jennifer always has great blog posts. And I know that's a, a topic near right. and dear to my heart. Uh, there's got to be a better way to do professional learning than some of the things that I have experienced and probably delivered in, in my time yeah. in education. Well, I have uh, something special to share Ooh. today. It's time to pre-order my book. I can't believe it. I I have I have been uh, working on this for so long, pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into it, and it's actually on sale. <laughs> At least I'm recording this ahead of time. We hope I'm it's really on sale hoping right it's already on sale. <laughs> So if, yeah. it should be. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. So I'm like secretly worried about it, but don't worry. I, w- I will. I will take care of you. So. But I have a special offer. So anyone who pre-orders the book will get my online course, the Dynamic Learning Workshop, for free. So I'm giving it away folks. Um, <laughs> and this, this is all for you. So, so the workshop is actually a, a companion course that will take you deeper, not just a book study course, but this is actually going to, to get you, uh, into the book, go deeper, take some action and, and work through some things. So if you haven't taken a, a gander at shakeuplearningbook.com, go check it out. I have a free quick start guide so you can get a taste of of what's in store inside the book. And the book is broken down into three parts. Part one is where I really talk about just the why, why it's time to shake up learning. Part two is the what, you know, the things that are happening, the, the, the ideas that we want to instill in, in our classrooms these days. And then part three is the actual doing of the things, right? Instead of just reading about it, this is actually equipping for impact. And so this is going to walk you through the planning stages and how to actually transform the learning in your classroom. So something that I'm really passionate about, I've really just kind of poured everything into it. And uh, I think that you'll see my personality is is loud and clear inside uh, the Shake Up Learning book. So I hope everyone is as excited as, as I am, you are so I can't excited. Talk. You can't I'm so talk. excited. So, so <laughs> I might be super excited. Are. Yes, uh, yes. I'm running out of words, but uh, please, please, please go go check out and and I would love to hear what you think. So, uh, the tribe is a big part of of what I have been doing over the last couple of years. I think that wraps up episode 48 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. We have explored all kinds of ideas in this and maybe (laughs) even confused a few people on how to pronounce quizzes versus quizzes uh, <laughs> since we have discussed both. Um, but that's what we do here at the tribe. We make up new words and we give right. people new names. So, But uh, all in all, I hope you have some, some new ideas to add to your bag of tricks and you've had a little bit of fun along the way. Please continue to share with us. Leave us some feedback and uh, you know, keep keep being part of the tribe and and sharing everything on the hashtag and with us because you truly do make it um what what we'd love to do this this is it this is the tribe so um and if you if you're a fan leave us a review we would love to see uh some reviews in itunes and help other teachers find us as well so if you would take a moment to let us know what you think think of the the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, we would greatly appreciate it. That's right. All right. Well, we will see you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Bye, y'all.
Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power, and may the Googles be with you. Thank you.